Imagine for a moment if we spoke to each other at the grocery store the way we talk at each other in political discussions on social media. What would the produce aisle look like at this grocery store? For a little bit of visualization, each year in Spain, they have a big tomato fight. It's called La Tomatilla. Now, I would imagine if you were to add in some busted up watermelons and some mashed up bananas and angry people screaming profanities and clubbing each other on the head with zucchini and stalks of celery, that's what it would look like. What a, what a mess. If you're like me, navigating political discussion on social media or forums or blogs or at the comment section of news sites, you're probably left discouraged and stressed out. And with a diminished hope that we'll ever be able to carry on a civilized and productive conversation as a society ever again. I'm a conservative radio talk show host, and I make a living in the realm of political discourse. Now, there are a lot of assumptions that are made about me and about those in my industry. And tonight, I'm here hopefully to surprise you, at least some of you. I'm not here to share any of the political opinions you might expect me to share. I'm not here to tell you which cable news channel or which political party is better or worse than the others. At some point, we have to have a talk about how we talk to each other. Now, most of us would agree that there's been a fairly steady decline in civility in these last few years. Some blame politicians or celebrities. Some blame talk radio. Some blame late-night comedians or the news media. And I'm not here to tell you who I think or what I think is to blame. But what I think we can agree on is that social media has accelerated this decline in civility. It's been a wild ride in political discourse these last 10 or so years. I'll get back to social media in just a bit. But first, let's rewind time. Let's go back 20 or 25 or 30 years. The rough equivalent then of today's political discussion on social media, at least for me, was writing a letter to the editor of the local newspaper. I wrote a few of these when I was younger, and I remember when I wrote, I had time to think and to rethink. I had time to write and to rewrite. I had time to mull it over. And even after I printed out my letter and folded it up and placed it into a stamped envelope and into the mailbox in front of my house, even then there were a few hours until the mail carrier picked it up that I could back out. There was a natural space between anger and publish. And this space was enough room for a cool-down period. In this space, there was a natural dynamic of resilience and restraint, which are two very important components to civility. We flash forward to today. Most of us have smartphones, or we work at desktop computers, and we see our social media feeds roll forward. We see the news news uh, items come up, and we now have the ability to publish our, our reactions to these instantaneously. That space between anger and publish is now zero. And we've become accustomed to publishing our knee-jerk reactions and our emotional impulses. It's information superhighway road rage. You haven't heard that term in a while, have you? But there's no time anymore built in to think and to rethink or to mull it over while we wait for a mail carrier 
to pick up our, our ideas and our comments. We really do publish our impulses now. And while instant technological, instant publishing, global publishing, is a technological advancement, I'm not convinced that it's an advancement in our discourse. And it certainly is not a recipe for civility. The first edge of this online civility, for me, happened actually a few years before social media. It wasn't quite 20 years ago. I had a nephew who was playing in a state high school football championship. And there was an online forum that was devoted to discussing high school sports. And as a supporter of my nephew and someone who was interested in the game, I signed up for this forum. At that time, I worked in early morning radio. And quite often, I would grab a quick nap in the afternoon. So my online handle was Idaho Napper. Well, somebody from the other team, super clever, said, oh, Idaho Napper, you must be a kidnapper. You got me, yeah. <laughs> but they went even further than that. That would have been fine. But they suggested that I was a child molester in addition to being a kidnapper. And at that moment, even though my personal information was not tied to this anonymous online handle, it, it hurt and it cut a little bit. I remember how I felt at that time that there was somebody out there who would make an accusation against somebody they didn't even know that was so despicable. More recently, in a Facebook thread underneath a, a newspaper column that I had written, it was online, somebody who had created an anonymous and a fake Facebook profile said a few choice words about me, a few insults, but that's okay. I know what I do for a living. And I accept it, and I understand that that just comes with the job. But, like in the previous example, they went further. And they insinuated that somebody that I love very much was a streetwalker and a prostitute. That person that I love very much is my own mother. She's aging, but she is the sweetest person that you could ever meet. And as you can imagine, I was livid. Rage would not be an inaccurate descriptor of my emotion. And as my hands went to the keyboard to retaliate with words, I had a moment and I asked myself, is this reaction that I'm about to have going to be productive? Will it elevate the conversation or will it simply escalate the tension? And in that moment, I had a couple of very important realizations. The first was that the entire purpose of those despicable comments from an anonymous Facebook poster was designed to elicit the emotional reaction that I was having. And the second, and I think more important lesson that I learned, is that those despicable comments from that anonymous Facebook poster actually said far more, far less about me or my dear mother than it did about the person making them. When I understood that, I actually felt a sense of pity. And I wondered, what must that be like to be in a place where you feel the need to create an anonymous and a fake Facebook profile so you can accuse the mothers of people you don't like politically of being prostitutes? It wasn't a good place. So there was anger, there was a space, and ultimately a decision to not publish. It was actually easy to move on from that moment without reacting. So I propose a thought experiment. Imagine within social media's functionality, as soon as you type out your comment or your post or your tweet and you click the button to submit, a small one-minute timer emerges 
And in this one minute, you can choose to cancel your comment. In this one minute, you could decide if you wanted to hurl that insult, if you wanted to drop those five F-bombs, share that snarky meme, or shame the target of your anger. What would that one minute do? For some, yes, they'd use it to sharpen their criticism. But I think for many of us who have a craving and a hunger to elevate the level of our civility, not agreement, but civility, we would probably choose to change our words, approach it in a little bit a different way, or maybe not respond at all. Another phenomenon that you might see online, on a news site, let's say it's about a natural disaster, and there's the ability to comment underneath. Comments one, two, and three are usually about the subject matter of the news story. The earthquake, look how devastating. How do we get them some help? Comments four, five, and six start to deviate. And then by the time you get to comments seven, eight, and nine, it's an all-out battle over who's better, the Patriots or the Rams? or Ford or Chevy pickup trucks. And I wonder, how did it go from a news story about an earthquake to that? And then I wondered, how come I'm not running into these people in the produce section at the grocery store? The truth is, maybe we are. I had a realization a while back that the Internet doesn't bring out the worst people as much as it brings out the worst in people. We're not uncivil because we're incapable of being civil. That lack of space between anger and publish doesn't give us enough room to exercise those muscles of resilience and restraint. We're uncivil because those muscles are not getting the conditioning that they need. And if we are to advance through the challenges that we face in our society, we need a space, a place where we can share our opinions. And those opinions, they can be aggressive, but civil. Our debates and our arguments can be robust and they can be spirited, but civil. And I believe as we exercise those muscles of resilience and restraint, and we enjoy the civility that natu naturally grows from them, that we can restore order to our digital produce aisle. Thank you.